All right, everyone. Welcome to MevConomics. Uh, we've got a ton of great research topics set up here at the intersection of MEV, Ethereum, all things economics. Um, first, shout out to ETH Global and Flashbots for putting all this together, especially Tina and Sarah. Um, and thank you again, Tina, for informing me that I volunteered to be Roastmaster for this. Just a quick scheduling note. Um, all the presentations here will have some Q&A at the end, um, so please submit any questions you've got. Um, if you're on the live stream, we will be checking them. Um, I'll prioritize the spicy ones, so please no softball questions. Um, with that, I will get into the first presentation. There we go. Um, so this will just be a very broad overview to kind of set the stage for all of the other talks today. Um, this is basically the state of affairs for everything MUV right now. So basically, as everyone kind of knows, uh, merge happened at the end of last year, completely changed the block production supply chain. This is broadly what it looks like right now. Um, this picture comes from Barnaby, who's obviously working on a lot of the stuff over at the Ethereum Foundation. Um, so broad transaction supply chain users submit transactions. Um, searchers will take a lot of those transactions, make specific bundles, they send them to builders. Those go through relays and eventually validators will take those blocks um, that builders make for them and propose those to the network. Um, this kind of se separates that specialized task of actually building blocks um, so that validators can have permissionless access to MEV and not have the centralizing pressures of needing to be sophisticated actors um, who need to do that more complicated task. So this is what the builder market has looked like since the merge. Um, as you can see, it has diversified a lot um, since the start of it, or right around the time of the merge. Um, it was rather centralized in the beginning where there just weren't a whole lot of parties there yet. Um, since then, it has broken up very, very nicely, um, such that you have a lot of different participants who are all taking, you know, 10 to 15, 20% market share, and then the long tail of um, much smaller ones as well. Um, so as you can see kind of in this graph below at the bottom of the table below at the bottom here, some of these builders are able to take a nice margin on that, uh, for some of the bigger ones. These are the profits that, you know, some of them have picked up over the last week for some of the big builders. Um, some of them do run at a profit, like, as you can see with some of the bigger ones like Beaver here, or sing, uh, builder 69, um, and others just run at flat where they pass everything through. Um, which is the Illuminate Democratize Tribute, that one slash bots, that's what they do. Um, one of the other exciting things with builders as well um, is we'll start to see going forward, hopefully, is their ability in their kind of role here um, to add a lot of additional features um, going forward, which I would recommend you to see Alex Stokes' talks on those topics because that is a very long topic um, in and of itself. Um, so the big question here is that everything looks pretty good. Uh, from like the start of the merge, I think most people would agree that we're pretty happy with the way that the builder market is shaped out, that there's a good amount of decentralization now in that there's a lot of different participants in there who are acting pretty competitively. Um, so I would say it's a good start, um, but there's obviously concern that there are very natural, very strong centralizing tendencies in this over time. Um, so that's where it comes in trying to build an actually fully decentralized block building network um, that kind of plugs in here and is able to have many, many participants who actually contribute to even building a single block. Um, and that is exactly what Swab is, as I'm sure everyone here has heard of by now. Um, here's just a very quick overview of it. Uh, so moving on down to the next step of the supply chain, um, relays is basically kind of just the, the pipes in the middle between the builders and the validators who are sending those blocks along. Um, again, you see the very similar trend where at the beginning it was very centralized. It was Basically, everyone was using Flashbots for the most part. Um, and since those first couple of months, we have seen a lot of diversification in there, which has been really nice. Um, and the biggest one now is actually not Flashbots. Um, and it is, I believe, last I checked, it is the Ultrasound Relay, um, especially after they launched very recently, I believe a week ago. Um, they're optimistic relays. So that is kind of a, a new concept where you start to realize that there's a meaningful latency advantage if you cut out that kind of step of not requiring the val uh, not requiring the relays to actually validate the block that they are sending along um, to the proposers. That cuts off, you know, 100, 200 milliseconds of latency, and that does add a meaningful benefit. Um, so it does come along with some risks because now they are no longer checking the blocks that builders are sending them um, to the full extent. Um, but 
they're also collateralized by these builders. So builders who want to be able to get that extra latency edge and give their block a little higher chance of getting accepted, um, what they'll effectively do is they will just put up some form of collateral and, you know, hey, if my payment that I said that I was going to give the proposer doesn't go through for some reason, if something was screwed up, then you could take my collateral, basically give it to them, and I get kicked off of that relay. Um, so there's some element of trust in there, but there is also this fallback option um, to make sure that proposers don't just completely get rugged on it. Um, and recommend checking out the MethBoost community calls. There's been a couple of them now um, where a lot of this stuff gets discussed. So the general trend on this, I'm sure everyone has seen this chart by now. Um, and this goes kind of hand in hand with a lot of that diversification that we saw throughout the relay and builder market is early on um, the large majority of relay and builder adoption that we saw was primarily coming from ones who filter out OFAC transactions, which obviously got a lot of people worried in the earlier parts of the year, particularly if that started to continue to trend up, you'd potentially have to wait a rather long time um, if you were one of the sanctioned listed addresses. Thankfully, a lot of the relay diversification and builder diversification has come from parties who are not engaging in that, ones like Ultrasound Relay, who are not filtering those types of transactions out. So the, the big question kind of here becomes, is the Ethereum protocol is very kind of simple today. And most of these types of actors are sitting outside of the purview of the core protocol itself. So the perfect example of that is something like in, uh, in protocol proposer builder separation. So as of right now, we need those relays because there isn't this notion of that market structure and allocation mechanism for, for PBS actually built into the protocol itself. Um, so we do rely on those other actors. And similarly with concepts like restaking, is it possible to bring those kind of com commitments into the protocol such that the protocol is actually aware of those things? Um, and that becomes a very big question of what is it actually the Ethereum protocol's job to guarantee? Um, should it be bringing all of these things in if this is, if we see this as a really important and potentially dangerous role that is sitting outside the protocol that has a lot of power, something like builders, should we bring that into the protocol itself? Um, something like in, pro in protocol PBS, the nice thing about that is it removes the need for relays. So you get rid of one of these vectors for censorship in the middle, you remove that from another party, you make that kind of engagement between the proposer and the builder more trustless that you know that they will get paid. Um, but it does also mean that you are now enshrining additional complexity into the protocol. And there's a possibility that, you know, you find out a year or two later, oh, maybe there's this thing that we haven't thought of on the incentive compatibility on the economics of this structure. Um, so there has to be a pretty high bar to like actually enshrine something. And it probably looks like something like, um, enshrining PBS will take some time if it is going to happen. Um, so this is kind of the core idea between, uh, behind a lot of what Barnabé has spoken about in the past year, this concept of Pepsi, which he has, uh, mentioned before, which is effectively making the protocol aware, uh, it's, it's an idea. It's not a specific proposal or anything that's like an EFD or anything. Um, but it's an exploratory idea, at least, of what if we just make the protocol more flexible in understanding these kind of external commitments, um, as opposed to trying to enshrine everything uh, into the protocol itself, like a very specific uh, proposer builder separation model. Um, and this kind of re relates to restaking a lot. Um, because we're starting to have this idea where proposers can potentially opt into external commitments outside of the protocol that, hey, I'm saying I'm going to secure this other application, um, but the protocol is not aware of that at its core. Um, so there are obviously a lot of risks that come along with restaking that people are concerned about, um, but the reality is it's here and we just need to understand how to build with it responsibly. Um, and one potential uh, kind of answer to that is potentially just making the protocol more aware of it and being actually flexible as opposed to enshrining very, very specific and complicated mechanisms into the Ethereum protocol. So looking at the validator market here, um, I'm sure a lot of people have seen this before, but you see the similar trend of, we kind of realized that a handful of large operators do control a very, very large amount at stake. Um, and while we have high economic security, we also would like to much more decentralize the actual stake behind that. Uh, such that there are many operators behind it. Um, and one of the things there is obviously liquid staking providers. They have a number of operators who are underneath the hood of something like Lido, something like Rocket Pool. Um, and they obviously offer a lot of nice benefits to users. They're effectively a backdoor way of smoothing rewards for users. It gives them a liquid token. 
Um, so there's going to be a lot of development here on things like, as Lido would talk about with their staking router, being able to bring in things like distributed validator technology to hopefully decentralize kind of uh, the operators under the hood there even more than they are today. So one of the big trends that I we will definitely hear about later today um, and probably a lot for the next year is that users have mostly been not acknowledged a whole lot in a lot of the stuff that has been built um, in regards to MEP over the past year or two. Um, there aren't a lot of options to really give users back a ton of value today. Um, for the most part, you're going to send something to the mempool. Hopefully you set your slippage right such that, you know, you don't get sandwiched. Um, but there's not generally this kind of competitive process where people are bidding you back the actual value of what your order is creating. And that's kind of the core concept behind order flow auctions, such as what Flashbox has proposed um, with MebShare early on. There's a number of others who are building very similar solutions, whether that be Block Native and others. Um, and this is basically that competitive process where searchers can say, hey, I realize that I can capture $100 if I have the right to back run this trade. So I should be able to bid in this auction. I'll bid $99 for the right to do that. And that kickback can then go to the user, returning them uh, some of that value. It becomes difficult to do this in a trustless manner. Um, and that's where a lot of the kind of programmable pr privacy tech that you hear about, that is going to need to be layered on over time, such that you're removing trusted components, like something like the person who's running the auction uh, effectively in MebShare early on, the, or not technically running the auction, but the matchmaker who's kind of doing this, you are trusting them. Um, and so removing those trusted parties is going to be a big part of flushing out these kind of systems. Another trend is going to be wallets. Um, they're a, they've been a bit of the sleeping giant for a while here, where they're in a very powerful position of aggregating user order flow and sending that through the supply chain. Like that is effectively where everything comes from. So the simplest thing for them to do is you strike private deals, you do payment for order flow. I hey, I'll only send it to this builder. You execute these for me. You kick me back some money. Um, the threat of that obviously is it becomes very centralizing. Um, that gets back to the centralized enforcers that we talked before with builders. Um, so you would ideally like to see a much more permissionless and open system where they're not doing that. Otherwise, we've effectively just created a worse version of TradFi um, if you kind of play that out. At the application layer, this will be another trend that you start to see over the year um, is most of the general purpose environments, like let's say Uniswap or Sundex or whatever on a general purpose environment, most of the value from that is generally going to go to the Ethereum validators, some searchers, some builders, et cetera. Um, but realistically, applications want to be able to capture that value from, for themselves because that's one of the core values that they do create. Um, so you see very custom uh, ideas around this stuff, like Osmosis um, is implementing a module where their validators will just automatically do these arbitrages and capture that revenue for themselves to be distributed as they want. It's much easier to do in an app chain, um, something like that, where you can just actually customize the consensus becomes more difficult in a general purpose environment. Um, and then lastly here, we have L2s. Uh, you'll hear a lot of this for uh, for Hasus and through Instock later on, um, but MEV is obviously going to be a big problem on layer twos. It doesn't, the problem doesn't just go away once we kick it up there. And it already even is a problem today, even with the centralized sequencer. Um, so even without decentralizing at all, there are meaningful problems um, that do need to be addressed significantly better because the naive implementations of this, something like a first come first serve, uh, you just end up with these latency games. And as Tarun will explain later, uh, the idea of fair ordering is a bit questionable. Um, so decentralizing it will make it even harder. Um, and you introduce a lot of new complexities and how, how do we try to maintain a private mempool anymore now that we have more participants and here, stuff like that. Um, and the reality is, I think it's more important to deal with the MEV effects of something like first come first serve than it is probably to decentralize the sequencers, particularly in the short term, because the whole point of rollups is if they're implemented correctly, where you remove the operating keys, you have permission loop proving, et cetera, um, they're safe anyway, and users should be able to exit from them. And now you have this whole new idea also popping up of shared sequencers. There's a number of variations there, which we'll talk about later today. Um, one of them is what Justin has proposed called based rollups, which is kind of an idea based on what uh, Talika described a couple of years ago as total anarchy, which is basically letting the layer one itself sequence for all of the rollups that are on top of it. Comes with a number of trade offs kind of on UX um, and a lot of very different economics, um, which are very interesting. And then there are also other chains which are looking to provide similar services, ones like Espresso and Metro. 
um, who will be offering this kind of shared sequencing layer that many rollups on top of them can plug into. Um, and they will be providing that sequencing service for all of them. And that gives you a lot of exciting benefits. Um, it also, again, raises a lot of very complex questions around the economics and the trust in these systems, et cetera. Um, and those ones also do give you a bit of an easier route to one of the nicest things that people like about rollups as a user is you want those really fast pre pre confirmations. That's really difficult to do, possibly not practical at all to do um, with something like a base rollup where you probably are going to fall back to the L1 block times. Um, so these are all very interesting ideas, which we're going to hear a lot more about later on today. And that is all for me.